Very good morning to everyone. And many people possible of course how you're going to spend the money on all your questions on the budget itself. Also, are open to other questions that you might have uh, for other parts of the area, any questions you might have about what the council's doing or what the council intends to do. So the idea is to try and keep it focused on the finances, uh, but clearly if you have other questions, we'll try and take as many of them as possible as well. There's a number of different ways that you might well be joining us. We're on Facebook, we're on YouTube, we're on LinkedIn, and I think we're also on Twitter. And the way to ask any of the questions is simply to use the comments on, on the comments section on whichever social media medium you're joining us on, uh, and that will feed into our central database. And I'll keep an eye on the right hand side and try and answer as many as possible. So before we jump in uh, and I introduce the other guests that I've got with me today, we've got a short video to outline the budget process that we've been going through and some of the highlights. We have recently set the council's budget for the year ahead. Despite unprecedented national financial pressures, BCP Council will deliver a balanced budget that invests where it matters most. Inflation has risen at its fastest rate in 40 years. We're having to spend more to light our streets, fuel our rubbish vehicles and provide care to adults and children across our communities. Running the council over the period 2022 to 2024 is predicted to cost £54 million more because of these inflationary pressures. But we've managed to budget through these challenging times and have taken major steps to work more efficiently and increase income. These decisions mean we predict a £10.1 million surplus at the end of this financial year, a surplus we will use to support our 2023 to 2024 ambitions. Despite these challenges, we're determined to improve the lives of our most vulnerable people. We will invest an extra £14.6 million in our children's services as we continue to deliver on our commitment to improvement and an extra £25.5 million to adult services. Our budget provides financial security and supports the delivery of key council services with a 2.99% rise for the basic council tax and a 2% rise for the social care precept. Our overall council tax is lower than many other local authorities of a similar size. We must remain financially resilient and sustainable into the future. We will continue to deliver on our big plan commitment to invest in our iconic place, build new homes, create jobs for local people and create wealth for our businesses and families. This is a budget of hope in difficult times that will help deliver our ambitions to create a modern, efficient council that supports all our communities in this beautiful place that we call home. Well, I hope that gives you a little bit of background and flavour as the work that's been going on behind the scenes as we look to put together the, the council's budget. I think important to note, first of all, a tremendous amount of hard work that goes on, uh, not just from uh, the politicians, you know, the, the uh, uh, cabinet colleagues of mine that oversee the different areas, but also the, the, the stakeholders that we work with and all of the council staff, because it's a long process. In order to uh, set a budget for a council of this size, at the very best of times, we start work probably the preceding summer in order to set the budget uh, in February. Of course, this year, and as you've seen with the video, we've had some really, really strong headwinds. Uh, 54 million pounds of additional pressures cost to the council just by inflation. So to put that in context, when we set our budget last year, 
we didn't have the the, the war in Europe in, in Ukraine. We didn't have the inflationary environment. That has all come a little bit out of the blue. And yet we are sat here today, continuing to invest in some of our most vulnerable, 14 million pounds extra this year alone into children's services. So that's a, a doubling of the budget into protecting our most vulnerable children over the last few years uh, and all of the other investments uh, whilst pu putting forward a balanced budget and indeed um, a 10 million pound surplus at the end of this year as well. And that's only possible due to the hard work of so many people, uh, including the staff. So thank you to everybody that's working tirelessly to make this happen. Now, we'll jump into questions uh, in a moment, but I'll, I'll also introduce uh, who I've got with me here today. So I'm joined to my to my right by uh, Graham Farrant, who's the uh, Chief Executive of the Council. You can kind of see him there. So there's Graham. Uh, and to my left, I've got Adam Richards, who's our Chief Financial Officer uh, on that side as well. So he'll be able to uh, answer any of the more specific questions that we may have uh, throughout the course uh, of the session. But as I said before, now's your opportunity. Pop your pop your questions into uh, into the comment section of whichever medium you're joining us on and we'll start to get stuck in as soon as possible. You've seen the headlines, you've seen some of the, the, the major uh, amounts that we're putting into to different areas. Uh, but if you've got any specifics, uh, then, then please do please do join in. Um, I'll, I'll start already. We've got some uh, some questions coming up, and of course, you know there might well be other areas that you might want to talk about as well, which are outside of the budget. I've got one at eleven o four, which is coming from Mike Warren, which is actually not about the budget, but it is about a very real issue, which are uh, you know our roads and some of the road works that are going on. So Mike says, when are you going to stop uh, SGN, uh, which is the gas network, taking the Mickey, digging holes and leaving for months? Well, uh, really good question. Mike. We've seen, particularly in some areas, Christchurch has been hit really heavy at the moment, a number of prolonged roadworks that have been going on, which are entirely outside of the council's control, really frustratingly from us. So um, any of the utility companies, whether that be gas, electricity or others uh, that have to do emergency work, can do so. Uh, it, it's completely within the law for them to, to start digging up the roads. I think there's some concern from some of us that they're a little bit too reactive on these things and there's a lot of emergency works that are going on and not enough planned works which then leave us in this compounding situation. Uh, but it is very, very difficult. We work very closely with them to try and manage and mitigate the problems as much as possible. Uh, but clearly when gas works need doing, they need doing. I think one of the things that we are going to be looking at and have been for some time, there are ways that we could go a little bit further. For instance, we can. there's a legislation coming along um, around lane rentals so the council can actually charge the utility companies for, for uh, closing a road, uh, which means that they're still able to do it, but there's a real incentive for them to then get on and deliver the work as quick as possible. And that's something that we're really looking to do. Um, but, you know, it is a very difficult situation and we will continue to keep putting the pressure on them because we've got a very very fragile road network, as we all know, uh, and we all know that as soon as one piece of that puddle, puzzle gets jammed up, well, we've seen the situation um, elsewhere. So thank you to Mike for your question. We are looking uh, at how to get them to stop taking the mickey, uh, and we'll update you more when, we, um, when, we, when we've got a little bit more information on that. Um, so keep your questions coming in, particularly if it's around uh, the budget. The outline video um, talked about the different ways we're, we're handling that inflationary environment and to try and keep investing in those important things like our children and adults and uh, you know, vulnerable people and, and the place as well. And part of that is, is income. Um, looking at the, the great environment that we've got, trying to make it better and also generate income as well that helps protect services uh, for, for, the, for those most vulnerable. I think a really good example of that is our seafront offering. Uh, we've got a lot more going on on our seafronts uh, over the last few years, bolstered by big events that we've got throughout the year, like the Air Festival. Uh, and last year, we had a pretty record-breaking year, around £6 million of, of profit, um, as profit income um, for all of the stuff that makes our seafront excited. That profit is what helps us to uh, avoid having to make cuts or invest in other areas. So we're always looking at those new ways uh, that we can ensure that we are simultaneously investing in the future, making our area as nice as possible, but also um, generating income uh, because the more that we earn as a council, uh, the less reliant we are on um, on having to make savings and efficiencies elsewhere. Um, so that's a little bit of background about some of the work that we've been doing on income. Um, just having a look through the comments and see which uh, are there any comments that are are coming in uh, now. So let's have a little look at um, BH9 uh, business uh, community. So let's look at this one. Please will the council, that's at uh, 10 past 11. 
Please will the council at least consider the idea of outsourcing littering whereby a contractor may issue spot fines. It works for Hertfordshire District Council. I know everyone is appalled about how dirty BCP has become at times and that alone is a deterrent to uh, tourists while sort of giving permission to everyone to continue to litter. Um, completely agree, uh, BH9, business community. Thank you very much. We've been trying to tackle that in a number of different ways. And indeed, uh, the, the litter finding is something that we, we've trialled and we've, we've looked at in various uh, various different forums as well. It's, it's just terrible, isn't it? Particularly, not just visitors, but but residents as well. There is no excuse for littering um, you know, our beautiful place. So there's there's a little bit about working with um, uh, the police and, and uh, the more community officers that we've got to dissuade people and stop them doing it. Uh, but we have been looking at initiatives as well uh, around spot fines. Graham, is there anything you want to, to say about this? I've got the chief executive with me as well um, to be able to give further input. So I'll, I'll go to Graham on this one as well. Yeah, uh, just want to show the people, hopefully people can hear me through your microphone. Good, so we're trying not to get any feedback from things. Um, so for me, it's all about trying to work out, so, so what are the priorities? What, what are the things we need to do? And how do we stop people doing unreasonable behavior and you know, littering in particular? Um, something that most people don't do when they see clean streets and uh, we want to try and avoid the first bits of litter. So we are very proactive on our, our street cleaning regimes. Uh, we've got a good responsive service as well. There's a comment elsewhere about potholes. So um, please report anything you see. If you see some fly tip waste, if you see some potholes, please report them using uh, the apps or the website because that way we can get them straight through to the teams, get them cleaned up. And what we tend to find is if there's no litter around, it's always difficult to drop the first bits of litter. Uh, if, if fly tipping is left around, then people often add to it in you know, really sort of antisocial ways. So we're really keen on looking at behaviours, we're looking at enforcement where we need to, um, but actually the key thing we've got to fundamentally change is, is to stop people dropping it in the first place and get people to, to realise how unacceptable it is. Yeah, thanks, Graham. And we have trialled before um, uh, a finding for litter. Um, the, the slight issue with it is you can only actually find somebody if you uh, if you physically, if the enforcement officer physically sees them doing it. Um, so it, it is a bit tricky, but as Graham said, um, getting to the root of the cause, uh, keeping your place clean as well. We have put millions extra, and I appreciate the comment that you know there are parts that uh, the area that may well seem dirty, but we put record investment into street cleaning in a number of our areas because we quite often find that as, as Graham pointed out, it, it, it's, it, it's easy to litter in an area where there's lots more litter. It's, it's really um, much more embarrassing and, and, and difficult if, if it's a beautiful area which we want to, to keep in. I think on the potholes points as well, we have, as every local authority has seen, an unprecedented number of potholes this year. Uh, we've had a couple of mild winters and the combination of wet weather and cold weather and then wet weather again has meant that I think since since January alone, we've had, uh, you know, something like uh, that 80% of our potholes for the year have appeared uh, since the beginning of this year. As Graham's pointed out, um, we have a reported system, so the, the pothole guys are out there, you know, at speed trying to fill in as many as possible. Um, uh, but the combination of, of weather has meant it has been a particularly difficult time. But we only know where they are um, if you let us know. Adam, anything you want to, to say on that issue? I've got the Chief Financial Officer, Adam Richens, with us. Yeah, just to say with regards to the issue of potholes, um, the expenditure the council is incurring this year, 22-23, includes just over um, £2.1 million pounds that were allocated by the government under its local transport um, capital plan. And clearly we're, we're busy um, spending that um, as, as we speak and we're hopeful of a similar allocation in 23 24 Brilliant. Thank you, Adam. So I've just noticed it was Emma that asked that question. Thank you very much, Emma, and hope that gives you some confidence that it's you know it's one of those top priorities. Uh, I'll move on. The, the questions are now coming in thick and fast. There's one at 11 minutes past 11 from Chris Petro uh, coming through on Facebook. How are you going to tackle the antisocial behaviour which has been flourishing around? Well, thank you for that, Chris. And absolutely, um, getting on top of antisocial behaviour has been one of our key priorities over the last few years, which is why I think last year alone we put another two million pounds into it. Um, it's also not something we can do by ourselves. So we have to work really closely with the police uh, and other partner agencies. And actually the joint working that we've done with the police alongside the extra investment that we've seen has seen some really significant reductions in antisocial behaviour, um, not just over the last 12 months, so around a 20% reduction over the last 12 months. But even over the last six months, I think we've seen another 10 or 12% uh, reduction in reported antisocial behaviour as well. So it's we're not there by any stretch yet. And again, 
again, you know, we only can tackle it if we know where those hot spots are. Um, but I'm really pleased that um, it, the, the extra money that we put into that does seem to be coming through. And I think it's something to be quite proud of for the people that have been involved in that, our, our, our officers that are on the ground, the, the, the council staff that we're trying to give new powers to and the police to see that 20% reduction. We've also seen a dramatic reduction in crimes reported, particularly local crimes, particularly actually crimes in parks, which was um, something which pops up every now and again. So a lot of extra money has been put into this, uh, and hopefully I think that the stats uh, speak for themselves on that one. A lot more work to do, um, but only yesterday I met with the, uh, the Police and Crime Commissioner, uh, David Sidwick from Dorset, uh, and that kind of relentless approach that we've got to that will be continuing into the future. So thank you, Chris, uh, for, for raising that point. Um, right, let's move on. I've got a question at 11.13 from Liam Morris, again on Facebook. So there are lots of talks during the budget debate. Um, and if you watch that five hour session, so um, obviously uh, uh, TV wasn't uh, that exciting that night uh, about the future of the air festival. Could you give us an update on this and talks on other events such as proposed Formula E street race? Well, great question, Liam. And look, I, I do want to put on record that setting a budget for the council of this size is never easy at the best of times um uh, we we have a, a council with lots of different parties in as well so it's absolutely critical for me as leader to be working with other parties so i want to put on record my thanks to the other parties for getting in the room sitting down with me um last week and over the previous weekend so that we could look at areas which are important to other parties share them and actually we made amendments to the budget that I presented which took into account um, lots of the priorities from other parties so that we were left with very very few areas of, of, of disagreement. I think that's the way we should do politics and I'm grateful uh, for the approach in doing that. One of the areas we did disagree on um, with the other parties uh, was uh, was around the air festival and actually there are some uh, there were some other proposals from other parties which either scrapped the air festival or, or severely curtailed it. Look I think we need to have a long-term uh, grown-up conversation about the air festival but actually considering the next one is only six months away and considering it is a vital lifeline to many parts of our uh, our local economy hotels hospitality um, I thought it was really important that we protected that and I was really pleased that, that, that we won the argument on that and we, we won that vote uh, we've had some independent statistics around the air festival because it's not just about pretty planes flying in the sky it is about the impact it has on the local economy uh, independent assessments show that it's worth about 49 million pounds to the local economy and that's not just Bournemouth because it affects uh, positively the whole region uh, and what we also try and do with the air festival is that we've always used it to extend the season so for the last few years it's been in early September which is an air, a time that isn't traditionally as busy uh, and to give you an example the cafe at the end of the pier has its had its busiest day ever on record last year during the air festival so it is important um, to the local economy uh, i'm constantly told by uh, the uh, in many aspects of, of businesses uh, how important it is to extending the season and it's something that i'm really pleased that we have definitively now protected uh, for this year uh, and i think it's something that we can all be proud of it brings in i think around uh, i think last year almost a million extra people into the area and that's exactly what we need in these uh, difficult times that injection in into the economy so pleased to be able to protect it um, I'm long-term committed to it but equally you know we do have a need to have a chat about how we can make it more sustainable both financially and and climate change wise in, in the long term as well uh, Liam on your other point about other proposed uh, races you know we have had interest from a private promoter for the Formula E street race as well We've engaged with them really positively. It's not something that is being led by the council. It would be led by others. Um, but I think any of those events that continue to put Bournemouth Christchurch and Pool on the map, that bring in investment um, and, and are exciting events that local people can enjoy as well, absolutely we've got to look at them one of the things that we did after the pandemic was invest quite a lot of money into a huge season-long event program which we called festival coast live done that for the last couple of years with the aim of getting uh, an eventful town or towns as as part of our standard practice so rather than just one or two 
try and encourage loads of different events. So there's always activity going on somewhere in Bournemouth, Christchurch and Paul. I think that investment was really welcomed. It helped us to bounce out of the pandemic. And, and I certainly will talk to anybody that wants to uh, uh, you know, look at events that aren't going to uh, negatively affect the area. And, uh, and that's certainly the case with Formula E. So we'll see what comes of that. It's not a council initiative. It's a private initiative. Um, but I think it could be you know, something really exciting uh, if it comes off as well. So thank you very much, uh, Liam, for that question. Right, we will now uh, move on to uh, other questions that are coming up. Uh, I've got one um, uh, from Matt Gibbs coming from LinkedIn. So what are you doing to support brick and mortar businesses? Rates are meaning more empty uh, empty shops on high streets. Uh, surely reducing rates, getting businesses thriving is better than no business at all. It's, it's a really interesting point, Matt. And of course, there are things that the council controls and things that we don't control. And business rates are one of those things that are, are nationally set. Um, I have regular meetings um, with government on this issue. Uh, and I do think that you know we are coming to a time where we really have to reassess the business rates uh, situation, which is, is born out of a day that of, of different times, as we only need to look around any of our high streets. And, and let's remember, we don't just have our three core high streets of Bournemouth, Christchurch and Paul. We've got 19 district high streets as well. So we have to figure out exactly how we can support them in all the different ways. I think I'm seeing a bit of a tale of two high streets at the moment. So many of our district high streets, I think people have connected really positively with them since since COVID. They've reconnected with their local high streets. So whether it be uh, Westbourne or Kinson or Southbourne or Broadstone, those district high streets have found their new footing, I think, and are really buzzing. It's the core high streets of the Bournemouths and, and the pools in particular, uh, which are struggling, and they are the ones that are really affected by this issue of, uh, you know, of business rates. So it's something that is not in our control, um, but we continue to look at um, to help support our high streets. Put a number of initiatives. Uh, since the pandemic, such as we, we piloted some uh, funds we put into the district high streets to get them to bounce back, chose three pilot areas. That was really successful, and we'll be looking to try and take the lessons and the framework uh, into others. And we also work really closely with people like our business improvement districts. We've got two of those in Bournemouth, one in Paul, one in Christchurch. Um, uh, they are the voice of the business and are funded by the businesses to try and find new initiatives uh, to how to ensure our high streets are sustainable for the future. What I also did as part of our recent budget is, is to create a new high streets renewal fund as well in recognition for the fact that sometimes you need a specific fund that you can help to, to tackle this issue head on um, and, and just keep on working with people. Uh, it's a difficult one. Take Bournemouth as an example. As a council, we don't own any of the buildings in Bournemouth. Um, so if there are empty shops, for instance, there's not much that we can physically do uh, in terms of intervention, although there are elements coming through with the new levelling up and regeneration bill that could give us powers to directly intervene and force the rental of empty shops. So that, that might be coming soon. Uh, what we can do is try and set the vision. Uh, we've had a number of initiatives recently, to, again, to give Bournemouth as an example. We've had um, some work around Westover Road, how to revitalise that, and that's coming on. We put something called a supplementary planning document to unleash some of the investment that's happening on Avenue Road, on that commercial roadside in, in Bournemouth. And then to look at Poole, we've got a heritage uh, action zone. So that's using national lottery money and government grant to help some of those businesses that are more uh, historic and beautiful buildings to uh, to refresh them, to encourage more people, to make it more beautiful. That's been really successful. And then over in Boscombe, we've got our, our, our 20 million pounds uh, towns fund from government to rejuvenate Boscombe as well. So lots going on, um, but I do agree with you, uh, Matt. Business rates are one of the big things that holds uh, these businesses back and we'll keep on pushing on that level. So thank you for the question, Matt. Um, right, I'll now go on to a question from... Let's look from Aaron, Aaron Gibson coming in from Facebook. So this is about, uh, about transport. So uh, Aaron says the barrel rollout has been great across BCP and Wimbledon Ferndown, but the demise of yellow buses will undoubtedly a setback for public transport across the conurbation. With the budget pressures, is there any realistic prospect of uh, the greater Bournemouth area? We'll be careful about using that phrase, uh, Aaron. It doesn't go down well everywhere. Um, uh, exploring light rail uh, could be a good way to put BCP on the map and demonstrate the viability of that integrated transport network of bicycles and e-scooters. Great question, Aaron. Actually, one that I, I get a lot. We actually did a report on this. The, 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 the transport team did some work on this 
I think last year it might have been uh, Graham around um, around the feasibility of things like a tram network or light rail um, was an interesting piece of work. Two of the outcomes uh, from that was that actually um, and look, this the, people could argue about this, but we have a really good bus network as is. Um, I think that's in some ways helped by the fact that there is now one main bus provider in, in more bus that run more bus and unibus and, and things like that because there is a more kind of consolidated service so we've got a very good bus route um, and the costs of things like light rail and tram uh, are really quite enormous because of the infrastructure um, that is that you have to put up front on those things so it takes a long time to pay back and you can only really do it with some kind of beefy government funding so something we've looked into, there's a little bit of analysis that says because of the linear nature of Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole, because we don't have you know one town in the middle and everything surrounding a kind of hub and spoke model, because they're quite stretched, um, it doesn't suit its well, itself as well to that kind of mass transit model um, because you need lots of different routes going everywhere where they only tend to work if you have you know kind of a, a central location. We don't quite have that that uh, city-like arrangement that other urban areas do that would, would help it, which then makes the final of it a little bit more difficult. What we are doing, however, is looking at all the different ways that we can promote sustainable transport uh, and encourage people to, to use it if they can. You know, we've been really clear that this is not about, you know, I'm very against forcing people to do anything. I don't think there's any utility in closing roads or introducing permits, um, as we've seen in other areas, to stop people doing something. What you want to do is encourage those that can travel more sustainably to do so. We've had the £100 million travelling uh, transform, transforming travel programme that we've had over the last few years, which has been investing into you know more cycling routes and enhanced bus routes and things like that. We've geared that money towards helping people to do that rather than discouraging them not to do it. I think it's a really important principle of ours um, that it's about your travel, your choice, not about uh, kind of forcing people to do anything different. And that is already having an impact. Again, we've got closer working relationship with the, the bus company that we have now, one bus company rather than a couple. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to work on that. Um, one thing we can't do is build new roads. Um, uh, we don't have enough room, as we all know, to build roads. Uh, more people are living in the area, which is great. It means investment. But if you can't build new roads, uh, then any more people that use the roads with cars means that the an already congested place gets even more congested so we have to keep on striving to uh, find new ways for people to get around uh, we'll continue to work on the trams you know i think it's a really interesting point what we are doing is we've been looking at with network rail about whether we can use our current rail network more efficiently so whether we can have a metro style um, uh, rail offering on the current rail because actually if you think about it our train runs pretty much all the way through the conurbation so can we use that more? We've been having some conversations about that uh, and just keep pushing as much as possible. And of course, if the government do launch any new fruity schemes for big, uh, big funds of money in this area, we'll always be at the front of the queue for that. But thank you, Aaron, for that question. Right, keep them coming. Um, a reminder for those that are, are joining, whether you're on Facebook, whether you're on Twitter, whether you're on uh, LinkedIn or YouTube, if you put any of the questions into the comments bar, uh, we'll, we'll try and get through as many as possible during the session. Uh, equally, I do have our council team on hand as well, so uh, invariably there'll be lots of questions that I'm not able to get through, and we'll try and get you to uh, answer those um, uh, as well. Um, right, let's have a look at some of the other questions. The light rail has obviously got everyone um, talking, uh, as it always does. Um, right. Let's have a little look. Uh, question 1124 from JJ Stevens. What's happening with that site on the other side of the BIC? Right. Let's have a think about what you mean, uh, JJ. I think, well, there's a lot going on around the, the, the BIC. So you've got the Bournemouth International Centre itself. There's a big kind of grassy hill next to it, which is uh, was originally allocated for a hotel training school back in the day when it was when it was purchased. Um, but we've also got plans um, around the Winter Garden site as well, which you might have heard. And one of the things that we've been looking at, we're really keen. There's a huge regeneration opportunity with those sites combined. For, for a number of years, you know, uh, the Bournemouth International Centre was built in 1984. Uh, the conference centre offering is moving on, so we've got to think about how we can update that. And of course, we've got a lovely big site at the Winter Gardens, which we've been working on for a while. One of the things that we've been doing 
I've got our council-owned regeneration arm called Future Places, some really good talent uh, in, in that operation. And we've been looking at uh, whether there was a neat solution to take all of those sites in total. And what's coming through from, uh, from our regen team in Future Places is uh, there may well be a plan to, to actually look at the replacement of the Bournemouth International Centre, but not do it on the Bournemouth International Centre site itself, do it on the Winter Garden site. So that way you can keep the continuity of Bournemouth International Centre going. So you have to close it for a few years while you build it. You can build a new fit uh, version of it for the future in the what is now currently the Winter Garden site. And then that would open up the, what, the current very big site for the Bournemouth International Centre for some even better seafront faced uh, regeneration uh, coming uh, coming through as well. So that's the, the current thinking which is evolving. And that's a piece of work that's going on at the moment. But I think it's absolutely the right thing to look at. We've got huge um, swathes of land in that central part of, of Bournemouth and I think there's some real opportunity there. I mean, a lot of regeneration going on uh, across the whole of Bournemouth Christchurch and Paul. Uh, we're taking papers in our cabinet meeting next week uh, for the old Christchurch Civic Centre, so looking at proposals to, uh, to kind of use the waterfront more um, uh, you know, open it up more there and have that as a, a you know, new boutique hotel, which is kind of coming through. Uh, also, the Pool Civic Centre site uh, regeneration there. And of course, we've got the largest brownfield site on the south coast with the former Pool Power Station. Uh, and again, the plans for that are coming forward at pace. So a lot going on on the concept of regeneration, because that's how we really uh, rejuvenate our towns as well. So hopefully that answers your specific question, uh, JJ. There will be some more updates uh, coming on that uh, shortly. Right, let's look through the uh, the, the questions that um, uh, keep coming up. And right, um, I've got one from Anne-Marie Clark, which is about beach huts, so 1129. So how can you justify the huge rise in beach hut rents at Hamworthy Park? People are giving them up in droves and people in the list are in shock with the increases coming up for the next few years. Um, and we need to clean the beach, dredge sand and toilets too far away. Well, thanks, um, Anne-Marie. I mean, the question of beach huts has been you know, hot on everyone's lips over the last uh, few months. Uh, what we have done recently is, is we've got so many different rental um, levels of beach huts across uh, the whole of Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole. So recently we took a paper through which looks to harmonise the rental uh, amounts into two different levels. So it will see um, some above inflation increases in some areas. I think 50% of the increases that we put were around the level of inflation. But crucially, what those uh, what that kind of more harmonised approach of, of beach hut rentals does is 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 First of all, make the system fairer. Secondly, it gives us some really, um, you know, really positive funds to do some of the stuff that was on the last part of your question: clean the beach, uh, dragging sand, new toilets. So we've got is it four four million pounds, I think. Adam yeah. may well um, no four million pounds of extra investment that the. Um, this harmonization plan unlock so that we can improve the offer, uh, not just for beach shot owners, uh, but for all of those. Uh, so it's five million. I'm, I'm told, I love it when our chief financial officer gives me an extra million pounds, but that's five million pounds that this will uh, help us to invest in our seafront offering so that we can do precisely what you've suggested, uh, Anne-Marie, look at where we can put new toilets, where we can uh, improve the, the cleaning or, or dredging of sand. So it's not about um, you know, arbitrarily raising the amount uh, to, to go somewhere else. The, the income from that is all about helping to regenerate our, our seafront offering. We've got, I think, 15 miles of, of coast along our, our beaches and our, our harbours like at um, Hamworthy, and we need to have the money to be able to invest in them and make them fit for the future. A couple of other comments on that, uh, particularly with reference to Hamworthy that you've mentioned. Uh, you'll have noticed, hopefully, that we got originally 18 million pounds from government a few weeks ago as part of the leveling up funds precisely to look at our coastal communities um, which has now been uplifted we kept pushing uh, kept pushing back that's been uplifted to 20 million pounds one of the projects um, th that that is going to fund Amory is around the seawall in Hamworthy so again that's investment into making that area better and I think one of the final points I would talk about in terms of beach huts um, is we, we had a situation because we had lots of different agreements that it was possible for those people that lived out of the area to be taking a beach hut. Now, I don't think that's fair. I think uh, beach huts are one of the, the great things that we have as residents. Um, so actually, as part of those updated proposals, um, it's now set in stone that only local residents will be able to rent uh, uh, the council-owned beach huts. Uh, there are beach huts. You know, we, we welcome visitors from around the area, but it's one of the things that I think there were too many 
many uh, that were used by out-of-towners, so we changed those rules so that only local people can have access to our local beach huts. So hopefully it answers your question, Anne-Marie. Investment on the way, and in particular in Hamworthy, uh, you know, lots of investment coming in, in Hamworthy as well. Uh, right, let's see what other questions are coming in. Um, Right, um, just having a look through. Uh, one just, just come in hot off the press uh, from Nigel Witcher, 1135, um, again from Facebook. We need to do more for homeless people on Dorset streets begging for money. Well, there's a couple of points in there which completely, uh, uh, Nigel, apologies, um, completely agree with you. We've got, People often conflate um, beggars with rough sleepers, uh, and there's lots of lots of different ways to tackle the, the you know support people that need support and uh, and and to really push back against those people that are uh, that are you know are, are, are really taking the mickey in some circumstances. So again, working with our police and crime commissioner. Um, alongside other agencies, we work really closely with St. Mungo's, who are our partner around rough sleeping. Um, we've been simultaneously cracking down on those, you know, unacceptable, aggressive beggars. Uh, and let's be really clear, a lot of the people that you sometimes see on the streets are not homeless. Uh, they are people that are abusing the system and are aggressive begging. Uh, and we have powers against aggressive beggars, so we're clamping down on aggressive beggars, while also working with partner agencies to try and support as many of the real, true rough sleepers um, as much as possible. It's really complicated, um, Nigel. Um, a lot of people that find themselves uh, on the streets, uh, it takes a bit of time to engage with them. We always offer um, the ability, nobody ha needs to sleep on, on the streets in Bournemouth, Christchurch and Paul. A number choose to, and 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 part of our, our remit, part of our job, it's incumbent upon us to, 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 to make that a choice that they shouldn't be taking. Uh, and the St. Mungo's team are absolutely brilliant about on the outreach, they go around very early every morning, give them coffees, give, you know, engage with them, uh, so that those people that are choosing to be there, hopefully, get a level of trust that we can then provide the support that they need. We've had some really positive figures recently on, on rough sleepers, um, which has just come through. I don't have the exact figures to hand, so I'll, I'll confirm with them uh, afterwards. But I know that uh, one of our most recent um, uh, counts for rough sleepers was around 60, and I think we're now down into the 20s. So actually, the, the real work that's gone on through the council's rough sleeping team, St. Mungo's, the police and other partner agencies, means that we're now on a really low, you know much lower level for rough sleepers than we've had for quite some time time had some really good government support on that as well uh, and simultaneously i only met with the uh, police crime commissioner yesterday around keeping um you know keeping a real push on those aggressive beggars which are you know some of them hang out in the car parks and things like that. it's just not good enough and we're really clamping down there so i think the combination of those two means that you know fewer rough sleepers than we've had for some time a clamp down on the on the aggressive beggars but we've also done is taking a more long-term approach about this as well. So our last uh, cabinet meeting, we we agreed a fifty thousand, two hundred half a quarter of a million pound investment and a fifty thousand per, per per year revenue cost uh, to to a local group of you know really talented people that are working in this industry that have got together to form something called Hope Place. They'll be looking at taking St. Stephen's Hall in central Bournemouth, because that's where some of the hotspots are, uh, to have a centre which is then helping to engage with these people as well. And I think it's a really exciting initiative and one I was really so pleased to support as well. So trying our best, Nigel, the stats are heading in the right direction. Um, but, you know, in only the last cabinet meeting, we put more money and more effort into that so that we're not resting on our, our laurels. Right, uh, let's have a look at other uh, questions that might coming in. We've got about five minutes left for those that have other questions. You know, ostensibly this is one about the budget, so if there are any specific questions about the budget, please do let us know. But as you've seen, uh, we're trying to uh, answer as many other questions that we might uh, have as well. Um, right. Uh, see what other questions we've got coming in. Um, I have one around, so 
I'm trying to multitask here. Um, uh, from somebody from uh, joining us on YouTube, going nowhere. I mentioned earlier on about the civic centres uh, and asking around: Are Christchurch and Paul civic centres not more suitable sites than Bournemouth as a HQ for BCP Council? Christchurch is purpose built after all. Yeah, good question. Um, going nowhere, and uh, uh, hopefully my answer doesn't go nowhere. Uh, this was, I mean, this was this. These decisions predate uh, me in this administration, so it was taken by the the previous coalition to make the building that I'm currently sat in, uh, the, the, the HQ, the kind of central part of uh, BCP Council. It's part of our transformation program where we're all working differently now. So we don't need to have as many people based in one building. So we had to find a building that was the right size. It's big enough, but not too big. And, and the one that we're in here lent itself better. That does mean that we then have a number of buildings that are empty and vacant, such as the Christchurch and Paul Civic Centres. Uh, and we and through our regeneration arm, did a lot of research into the best use of those. Do you flog them off? Uh, we really didn't want to be selling assets if possible. We think it's important to keep the family silver for the long term rather than just cashing in now. Uh, and also, how do you use them as a bit of a platform for regeneration as well? And we were really surprised at the level of interest of both Pool and Civic and Christchurch former civic centres uh, to have them as, as hotels. There's a lot of private interest uh, in them to do so. It gives us a longer term income stream and helps to regenerate those areas as well. So take the Pool one as an example. If the core part of that is a nice high end hotel and we then look to develop the rest of the site, you have something called a halo effect. So it makes the area nicer, which makes the uh, the, the properties there nicer to live in, worth more either for sale or for rental. So it's it's part of a longer term regeneration strategy. Um, but yes, neither of those were deemed suitable as, as a current headquarters. And actually, um, you know, we're nearly reopening the the current former Bournemouth uh, town hall uh, as our as our new shiny uh, offering, which has. Uh, the room I'm in has a conference facilities so that we can try and work much more modern and more efficiently as we move through to the future. But thank you for the thank you for the question. Hopefully that gives you uh, a little uh, a little bit of uh, yeah, background. Um, right. Um, keep your questions uh, coming in. Uh, there's a there's a few questions around uh, mental health services for children and, in, and investment and schools. I think uh, you know, on that, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of I think the key the key features of the budget this year was our significant investment into children's services. Uh, we've had a children's services department that has been improving and we've been trying desperately to keep that improvement offer, uh, uh, to give it the momentum going forward, working really closely with government. So we put an extra 14.6 million pounds into our children's services function this year. Uh, you know, there are there are vulnerable children. They are the most important thing that a council can do is to make sure that we're looking after those most in need. And as I said earlier on, that's, that's pretty much a doubling of that children's services budget over the last two or three years and one that I'm really proud uh, that my first act as leader was to uh, see that significant investment going in. There was also a comment on there around schools and again really pleased that working closely with national government we've had not one not two not three not four but five of our schools in the BCP region um, uh, be awarded significant funds as part of the uh, of the schools rebuilding program so that's that's everything from Highcliffe School in in Christchurch all the way uh, through to schools in Bournemouth and in Poole so we're literally across the whole um, uh, whole uh, conurbation and I was really pleased to see that that uh, that chunky cash from government, uh, which will help some of those dated schools significantly improve themselves as well. It's not all about buildings, is it? But actually, if our children are taught in environments that are modern uh, and do have all those um, uh, you know, opportunities for technology and things like that, we're giving them the very best uh, chance in life as well. So again, it's really pleased uh, to see that, uh, that investment. And again, uh, you look at that level of investment we've had from government recently over those, those, those you know, number of different schemes, whether it be the you know, 21 million pounds for the Boscombe regeneration that we've got, the 20 million pounds recently for the Leveling Up Fund, which will uh, help the whole of our coastal community all the way through Bournemouth and Poole and Hamworthy uh, and beyond. Um, the, the the money that we've had uh, for things like the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, um, uh, as, as well as uh, all of the 100 million for transport, 
we, I think the real benefit of the area singing with a much louder voice is that we are getting those really chunky funds from government now and it's quite often those big funds that make the difference. Our job as a local authority is to set a balanced budget, uh, to, to kind of keep going um, uh, with the services that we provide, keep collecting your bins, uh, keep uh, investing uh, in our seafront and our, our communities um, but the big cash that we get from government really helps us to uh, to move that uh, forward at pace into the future. So um, final points from me, because we're, we're not seeing any more uh, questions coming in, but um, it's just to thank, thank you for joining us as much as anything else. What we've tried to do with the budget this year, as I've said, is to um, is to, to keep the ship on the road, um, keep the ship on the road, keep the wheels on the bus. Oh, well, I'm mixing metaphors now, but just keep that momentum going, investing in our place, investing in our children, uh, financial sustainability for the long term. So a 10 million pound surplus this year, which helps us to uh, invest in the future. And I kind of suppose a final point from me, it has been a very difficult inflationary environment, uh, but I'm really proud of the team that we've got here in the council uh, and the, the communities and the stakeholders that we work with. Um, you only need to look at some of the authorities around the country to see that some very difficult decisions are having to be taken, whether that be closing uh, leisure centres or, 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 or shuttering swimming pools. We've avoided all of that because we got ahead of this situation in summer last year, hence uh, finishing with a surplus, so that we're now able to uh, look at efficiencies uh, as we go forward uh, into the future, but to do so in a way that protects services and keeps investing in our most vulnerable as well. I haven't got through all of the questions because they, they pop up quite quickly, um, but what I will do is get the team to continue answering those questions that I've missed uh, over the next uh, hour or two. So hopefully if you have asked a question that it was entirely remiss of me not to answer, uh, then, then the team will come back to you. But thank you all for engaging. Thank you for joining. Uh, uh, we'll keep doing these um, fairly regularly so that you can keep asking your questions. Um, I'm also available by email. So if you do have any direct questions to me, I will get the team onto it. My email address is philip.broadhead at bcpcouncil.gov.uk. You can see it at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, reach out to me. You know, it is it is our job as councillors uh, to be your voice, doing what you say. Uh, we will listen and we will act. But thank you for joining us. Thanks for asking the questions. And thank you for the whole team for everything that they do.